Dreams, go your own way. You make loving fun. Don't stop. The Chain, Gold Dust Woman. These are the core tracks that make up Rumors, a smash hit for Fleetwood Mac, and it catapulted them to near obscurity to superstar status. But with it came breakups, drugs, explosive fights that would test every member of the group. This is the story of the most successful and the most famous lineup of Fleetwood Mac, the Rumors era. So sit back and enjoy the third installment of The Chain, the evolution of Fleetwood Mac. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Chain, The Evolution of Fleetwood Mac, Episode 3. I'm Sean Stewart alongside Jeff Coast. Hey, everybody. Glad to have you back this week. We have a really great podcast today. And on our last podcast, we talked about Bob Welch's introduction to the band, the move to Los Angeles, and the fake Fleetwood Mac scandal. And after the scandal ended, Welch decided that he wanted to leave the group, and this sudden departure already kind of put the troubled Fleetwood Mac into another bad situation and with no guitar player no musical leader once again the group was faced with the difficult task of having to replace yet another guitarist yeah Sean that's right um Prior to Bob Welch's announcement, Mick Fleetwood uh, was touring around Los Angeles looking for a new studio studio to record in, and he ended up at a place called Sound City Studios, which has now been demolished a couple of years ago. It actually was partially uh, in a subject of a Dave Grohl film recently. It might have been called Sonic City or something like that. But um, while Keith Olsen, which was the recording engineer of the building, was showing Mick Fleetwood around, he played him a song called Frozen Love. And that was to demonstrate to Mick the really high quality of the studio. But Mick became really attracted to the guitar solo going through the song. And he asked uh, Keith Olsen who the guitar player was. And Olsen informed him that the guitar player was uh, named uh, Lindsey Buckingham. And he was part of a duo called Buckingham Nicks. Uh, interestingly enough, Lindsey Buckingham happened to be walking into the control room at the exact same time they were talking uh, the, uh, about Mick Fleetwood and the Keith Olsen were talking about him. Keith introduced... Lindsay to Mick, and Lindsay didn't really know who Mick Fleetwood was. He just kind of said hello, they, and um, they talked for maybe about two seconds, and that's the, the, pretty much the basis of their, of their conversation, and Lindsay went about his business, and so did Mick. But what Fleetwood didn't, uh, did not know was that Lindsay Buckingham was, was at this time a very struggling musician trying to get his big break in, in the music business. And uh, we're going to break off from this just for a little bit to, to kind of give you guys a little bit of a background about Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. Uh, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks um, go far back as high school. They actually went to the same uh, Menlo Atherton High School, and they, uh, Stevie Nicks was a year older than Lindsey, and she graduated one year before him. And they had known each other on a friendly basis. They actually met at a high school uh, social gathering, and they kind of like kind of came friends after this. Um, after they graduated from high school, they became part of a band called Fritz, which was uh, actually formed by their high school friends, and. Uh, Fritz had some success in the San Francisco Bay Area in, in the late 60s. In fact, they actually even opened for Janis Joplin at one point. Of all the members in Fritz, it was pretty clear that the two people that had the most talent were Lindsay and Stevie. And um, after Fritz had disbanded, I think in 1970 or something like that, Lindsay and Stevie decided to hang around together, and they decided to form a duo called Buckingham Nicks. It was around this point w w w it was where they became a uh, romantic couple as well. And um, they released one album in 1973 titled Buckingham Nicks. It was under the Polydor record label, which is now, I believe, a defunct label. Uh, when the album came out, it didn't do well. In fact, it, it bombed. And it is, it is long out of print now, and, and you, the only way you can get it is on vinyl. However, um, and it's also never, it has also never been released on CD, although many Fleetwood Mac fans have asked and begged uh, Buckingham Nicks to actually release this album. And they've talked about it, but they have not done it. Well, sometimes the best sound quality is on vinyl, uh, and you just need to listen to that old school type of style to get to have the correct appreciation for the music. Yeah, that's true. In fact, uh, I actually had the pleasure of finding a vinyl copy. I don't own it. I've listened to it on vinyl. And also, thank God for YouTube, because somebody's uploaded the entire album on YouTube, along with all the tracks, and um, I highly recommend giving it a listen, because it's a really great album. If you want to hear... What a precursor to this era of Fleetwood Mac was, listen to Buckingham Nicks. And I really highly recommend to listen to Frozen Love because that guitar solo in that song is fantastic. After they were dropped from the Polydor label, uh, they were pretty much flat broke and they had no contract for recording. So they ended up moving in, moving in with Keith, with Keith, uh, Keith Olsen at, at one point 
but then they end up getting their own apartment. But basically, uh, what would happen was Lindsay would stay at home and write the songs and get them arranged. He would write his own, and he, and he would also take Stevie's songs and arrange them and get them ready to record. And while he was doing that, Stevie would actually be waiting on tables and cleaning apartments, and, and uh, also Keith Olsen's apartment as well. But, you know, by 1974, their dreams of success were clearly look, looking like it was never going to happen. You know, nothing. they hadn't had a record deal in about a year, and they weren't getting any uh, recognition. And it was just, it was looking pretty bad for them. But, um, and a strange twist of fate was so when, you know, when, and they were both close to giving up. But when Mick Fleetwood had uh, called up uh, Lindsey Buckingham after finding out Bob Welch was going to be leaving the band, he asked Lindsey if he would be join the band as, as an ex guitar player. And Lindsey agreed, but only on one condition, and that would be that Mick would take Stevie too. He, they, they would have to take, do, uh, take his girlfriend. And Mick initially was unsure about that because he said, well, I have to check with Christine McVie first. Because he was afraid of the fact that, you know, if you get two girls in a band and, and, and they don't like each other, you have a whole multitude of extra problems. <laughs> <laughs> but um, after talking with Christine, uh, she um, said, well, she'd like to meet the girl first. So they all got together at a Mexican restaurant on New Year's Eve 1974. And after, and after talking with the two musicians, Christine and Stevie really hit it off, and they, they became really good friends. And right then and there, on New Year's Eve 1974, Buckingham Knicks were now a part of Fleetwood Mac. And work on a brand new album started almost immediately, right, is, right, right into January 1975, they began work on a new album. And I believe it was mid-1975, Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac, was released, and that's the name of the album. That's all it's titled, is Fleetwood Mac. It's the first and only album to be titled this since the Peter Green debut in 1968. Um, it's also been regarded as the White Album as well, um, which some people might, might, might confuse with the Beatles. But yeah, this one actually has been also been considered the White Album. In fact, uh, this new album, I think that just calling it Fleetwood Mac is an appropriate title because it marks a new era of this band. In fact, something entirely different that in a sound that Fleetwood Mac had never had before this. And, and when you talk about n new eras of the band, for me personally, when I think of Fleetwood Mac, I think of Stevie Nicks. And those, and these are the names that kind of pop up to me um, when I hear the name Fleetwood Mac. So just kind of just titling that album Fleetwood Mac, it it kind of really brings home that this is the new the new era. This is the new Fleetwood Mac. And if you add another album title to the album, I feel like it takes away from that. Um, but just titling it Fleetwood Mac, it's simple. You know what you're getting. Even though for most of the fans who've been following this band throughout their career, it's a new band entirely. Exactly right. And um, when we mentioned in the last podcast that uh, briefly that after Bob Welch left and Buckingham Knicks came in, some people thought, who had no prior knowledge of Fleetwood Mac, thought this was a brand new band that just started. And unless you were following Fleetwood Mac prior to 1975, you would have thought the same thing. And if you weren't following them, you may have been very, very confused having what now is three reincarnations of Fleetwood Mac, the original, um, and then you had the fake Fleetwood Mac, mm -hmm. and now you have the, quote, real Fleetwood Mac, um, even though it is a new incarnation of the band. Yeah, uh, it's really, uh, just really interesting because, you know, every incarnation, there's something different. However, Bob Welch's uh, lineup was not totally a departure from the blues. This lineup is, the blues are pretty much gone. That old era has moved on, and Buckingham Nicks brought into uh, Pluto Mac, which was called a confessional songwriting genre, which was very popular among singer-songwriters of, of the 1970s, and that being the fact that a, a confessional songwriting is basically where you're writing a song and you're like burying your soul in these lyrics. You're telling everybody your business, what's going on, and it's a it's in a very uh, it's, it's a very appealing style of music that people just get into. And uh, when we do discuss rumors here in just a little bit, you'll see uh, confessional songwriting in its really purest form. Um, and Buckingham Knicks took Fleetwood Mac and they turned them from a blues band into a pop rock band. And, and there's also a little bit of folk in there on the side of, of Lindsey Buckingham, but they're definitely a pop rock band for sure at this point. And from the get-go, Lindsey and Stevie took, took creative control of this band and they became the leaders. Lindsey was the musical leader. He was really great at arranging songs and making them perfect. And the two things that these, these, these two had going for them which really helped catapult Fleetwood Mac into a, a very successful a career was the fact that Lindsey Buckingham is a phenomenal guitarist. He can arrange music greatly, and 
Stevie Nicks has a really great voice, and she can write really good lyrics. And you get this combination, and then you throw Christine V into the mix, you have a really winning combination. So um, with all this coming together, this, this whole new just create creative works here, this turned Fleetwood Mac into like a brand new band. And, and, and very much in a way, they just started over again. It really feels like they just started over. And one of the biggest changes to their sound was the, was the emphasis on vocal harmonies and the combination of all three vocalists. The blending between McVie, Nix, and Buckingham is really great. I mean, they have like this really almost chorus-like effect to their vocals. And this new sound has become synonymous with, with Fleetwood Mac ever since they've joined the band in 1975. And a prime example of this is a Stevie Nicks song, which is probably, a well, which is probably their most well-known song that I'm sure most of you who are Fleetwood Mac fans have heard this. Or if you're not, I'm sure you still have heard it. It's called Rhiannon. vocal tones of Stevie Nicks in this new iteration of Fleetwood Mac. And like I said previously, this to me is the definition of fl the Fleetwood Mac that I knew and that I used to grow up listening to um, that my mom would play all the time. Yeah, I remember hearing this song a lot when I was a kid, even before I was a Fleetwood Mac fan. And initially I was like, okay, this is a little bit annoying. But once I became a guitar player, I became a fan. This is one of my go-to songs to play all the time. I mean... This sound is unlike anything they've ever had before. I mean, the vocal harmonies, the guitar work is totally different. It's a really good song. The live version is really, from the mid-70s, is really good because Lindsay just lets loose on the guitar at some points, and man, I love that way he does that. Um, but you know, with Rhiannon, and, and this song has actually kind of started something for Fleetwood Mac. Uh, it, had, it added a mysticism to them, and, and, and in particular, a mysticism to Stevie Nicks. Uh, Usually during live versions and performances of this song, she actually would start dancing on the stage, twirling around while they're doing musical interludes into this song. And and the song is about, it, supposedly, as, she's, as she's, she has put it, about a Welsh witch. And this kind of added a little bit of a mysticism to Stevie Nicks about witchery or whatever. But it added to her appeal, and it added to the major appeal to the band. Um, when the new album was released in 1975, Things did not start off right away. I mean, it, it wasn't like a major success from the get-go. And the band actually went on tour as soon as the album was released. And they actually didn't really promote it very much when uh, when they first started touring around. Um, they still played some of the old Peter Green, Bob Welch era stuff. And they threw Rhiannon in there, I'm So Afraid, was thrown in there. A couple songs from the new album, but not a whole lot. Uh, in fact, actually, the, when the tour was starting off, everybody was still on, on kind of broke. In fact, Christine McVie actually slept on the amplifiers while they were on the road. I've read, uh, but once "Over My Head" was released as a single, that's when the album um, really catapulted into success, and then the band started making money. Uh, there were three singles released from this the, from this new album. It was "Over My Head," "Say You Love Me," and "Rhiannon," and all three were in the top ten, and they all have had major radio uh, playing ever since. We actually wish I, I could play the whole album because it's really good, all three tracks. Um, but we don't have that kind of time. But anyway, <laughs> um, there's a lot of information to cover in this. But if you have the time and, and, and just the time to check it out, I really just, just check out the first Fleetwood Mac album. It's really a great track. Um, and actually, while this album was making them money, 
it turned everybody into instant millionaires, pretty much, because they're getting so much airplay and so much revenue from this album. They became instant millionaires over almost almost overnight. And while Fleetwood Mac was a groundbreaking album, it would it would be nothing compared to its follow follow up, which, which was Rumors. But um, but the whole price of success would really weigh heavily on the band when they went into the studio to record Rumors in 1976. They were all in the midst of a personal turmoil within the group. All five members were in the process of breaking up with someone. Uh, John and Christine McVie were getting divorced. Lindsay and Stevie were breaking up, kind of getting back together, breaking up, getting back together, breaking up. And Mix, uh, Fleetwood's wife, Jenny, was leaving him. And it was there was a lot of fights during the recording sessions. And, and in fact, Lindsay would actually would refuse to sing his lyrics in front of Stevie because if she heard something she didn't like, she would yell at him and they get into a big fight and session would be over. So half the time... Um, and this is heard actually on, on a couple songs, the Secondhand News, the demo of Secondhand News on the 35th anniversary release of Fleetwood Mac, of, of Rumors, that is. Lindsay does not sing his lyrics at all. He kind of hums them and says very minimal words It's because if he said anything, Stevie would get mad at him. <laughs> and uh, But all this raw emotion that was going on between everybody in this band, all this anger and, and angst really came out in the songs, and it it made Rumors the success that it was. Um and every song on Rumors sounds like a dialogue between the couples of the band. Uh, Lindsay's singing songs about Stevie, and she's singing songs about him. Christine's writing songs about John, about wanting to leave John. And she's also writing a song about the light, their lighting director that she hooked up with on You Make Loving Fun. <laughs> and once John found out about him, uh, he was banned f- for good after that. So even with the new iteration of the band, still much drama to be had uh, inside the, the band, inside the individual lives of the band members. So no getting away from that. Uh, we thought we were in the clear from uh, the years past. We thought that you know the band was finally coming together, having all this great success, but behind the scenes, not so much. But it did lead to some great, great songwriting, um, and you have to think that some of the emotions that these members were feeling contributed to that. I have to agree because, you know, with... When I think some of the best music is written when you're really just feeling like crap. <laughs> when you're really upset about something and really something's like really breaking you down, man, you can really write some good, good, good songs. And although this whole recording session of this album was pretty much bad, I mean, in terms of what was going on between everybody, but man, the music is fantastic. We're gonna play a couple songs from Rumors. I wish we could again. I wish we could play this whole album because. There is not one bad track on Rumors at all. It's just it's an it's an excellent album I can listen to over and over again. Um, we're gonna play you a couple songs, these dialogues between each other. We're gonna play you a first a, a Stevie Nicks song called Dreams, and then we're gonna play you uh, Lindsay's response to her song Dreams and Go Your Own Way, and then her response to him in Silver Spring. <laughs> you enjoyed the, those little snippets of some songs from Rumors. Um, we'll have one more for you in just a little bit from that album. But 
I hope you really listen to those dialogues, the little subtle dialogues between, well, maybe, maybe not so subtle dialogues between Lindsay and Stevie here. <laughs> if you caught some of the, I know we couldn't play all this, the whole length of the songs, and I, I really wish we could because these are the kind of songs you just can't cut off, but due to our time length, we have to keep them short. But uh, Dreams, Stevie Nicks was telling Lindsay at this time, I, this is her nice way of telling you I want to break up with you by saying, well, now there you go. You, again, you say you want your freedom. Who am I to keep you down? It's only right the way you, you know that you should play it the way you feel it and you know thunder only happens when it's raining and when the rain wall washes you clean you'll know and basically that was her nice way of saying we're having a rough time now but we need to just end this and you know when it's over you and i will be friends that's what that's what when the rain washes you clean you'll know and you know Lindsay, Lindsay want i mean stevie wanted out but Lindsay did not want out and this really ticked him off and in Go Your Own Way, he basically says directly to Stevie, go, you know what, fine, break up, go your own way, I'm done with you. And, but, he, but he sounds hurt in the, in the verses, you know, loving you isn't the right thing to do, but how can I change, change things that I feel? You know, if I could, I'd give you my world, but I can't when you won't take it from me. That's pretty raw emotion there, and um, you could tell, you know, he really still loves her, and he wants to keep keeps together but she don't want to and so he's basically saying go go your own way there's one verse we didn't play and i really wish we could have which was when the second verse that he says um tell me why everything turned around and packing up shacking up's all you want to do that verse right there is what ticked stevie off and that this is what made her really be done with him he did it as a point to really just make a dig at her um she hated that line. In fact, I guess from what I've read, every time they would perform it on stage, she would give him the nastiest look every time he he'd, he'd <laughs> sing that line. In fact, if you still see him performing, he still looks at her when he says that line. I, emotions take tolls on people, um, and you're right. These aren't necessarily subtle jabs at each other. Um, pretty much telling Stevie to go your own way um, as a title of the song, um, as well as telling your your significant other to literally go your own way um it, not subtle hints at all but some great writing oh yeah and the arrangement of all these songs are really great go your own way is one of my favorite songs because it's just a rocking song he's like it's, an, it's a song that can really get you energetically charged either angry or happy either way it's just a really great song and i wish we could, could play the guitar solo because the guitar solo is just awesome on that song but basically after he she asked him to change that line packing up shaking up so you want to do it and he, and he refused and basically, and so in this whole thing of, and they were done, done by this point. They were broken up, done. And so Lindsay started bringing some of the girls around the studio, and Stevie hated that. And so when, so when she wrote Silver Springs, that's her way of saying to Lindsay, okay, I have no, no want to be friends with you now. And you know, don't tell me that she's pretty. You know, you could have been my Silver Springs, and you know, I know I could have loved you, but you wouldn't let me. And you can tell she's, she's you know, talking about her vocals. She's bearing her soul in this in that song, and Silver Springs actually was not released on Rumors. It was actually too long, and it's a shame because you know they put all this work into the song, and this is going to be Stevie's like opus, I guess you wanna, if you want to call it an opus on this album. And they told her after everything was completed, all the, all the recording tracks were done for the song. They told her that we can't include this as it's too long for a vinyl release, and she got really mad over that. And Silver Springs was replaced by a, an old Buckingham Nick song called I Don't Want to Know, which is a nice song, but Silver Springs is, is a little bit better than that song. Uh, Silver Springs was released as the B-side to the To Go Your Own Way, which I think is kind of funny, <laughs> pairing those two songs together. But um, in the 35th anniversary CD release of Rumors, which I do own, it's really great. It has a lot of outtakes and a live track listing. On the uh, CD version of the album, Silver Springs has now been included it's the last song on the album, or the last song on the album originally was Gold Dust Woman. But Silver Springs is a really great song. We're going to play one of Chris, Christy McVie's songs uh, now called Songbird. And this is probably one of the well, most well-known uh, songs off, off this album that everybody loves to hear. And, and it's been covered multiple times. Um, and this song is basically just a really nice song about love and uh, moving on. And we'll, we'll play that for you and kind of discuss it a little bit briefly. Someone 
Well, we hope you've enjoyed a little sample of Songbird there. Um, this one is definitely different than all the other songs on the album. For one thing, it's the only song to feature Christine McVie's solo. And this is the first time she's ever been featured solo. Um, there's no backing vocals, um, no drums, no bass. There is a subtle acoustic guitar done by Lindsay in the background, but it's very subtle. The piano in her vocal takes co- complete uh, center stage on this. It was recorded in, in the University of California, uh, one of their auditoriums, because the engineer, uh, Ken Kelly, who was a really great recording engineer, wanted to get like a very ambient sound effect and nice live sound and, and the acoustics of the of the record plant, which is where they recorded in Sausalito, was just not fitting for it. So they, they went to the University of California and cut the song there. Songbird, of uh, the songs that um, Christy McVie put on the album, you know, Don't Stop was telling John McVie, you know, don't be upset over our divorce. You know, the best, is, the best is yet to come. You Make Loving Fun is about her new relationship with her lighting director. But this one is, is, is not really a song about dissing somebody or leaving them or finding new love. This song is just, it's just about talking about wishing the best love to somebody you once loved or, or that you love now. It's a really pretty song. I know a lot of people like it. It's just a very nice so song. And this song actually used to close out every single every every single show they did. This was the the encore song. And just a very nice song. And in fact, it it became one of the anthems to hold the band together. The other anthem was The Chain. And The Chain was uh, a song that we we can't play because it's too long of length. It was a song about chains keep us together. In fact, that's the only song on the album that was written by all five band members. Each Somebody contributed something to it, whether it was a verse or a riff or something. These were the songs that kept, ironically, you think with Tara Band apart, but kept them together. And they all knew that despite our personal problems, I mean, we don't like each other at all, we got to stay together for the good of the band. And it's ironic, you know, going through a, a painful breakups and, and, and hating every single person you're in the room with and you're stuck with them for every day of your life. Uh, it was these songs that kept them together, and it, this is what you know. This is what added to the appeal of rumors. And in fact, the news of the band's inner, inner, turmo- inner, inner turmoil, excuse me, uh, began while the album was being recorded, and it was really great in the press and and very appealing to fans. So everybody kind of wanted to hear what uh, what what you know what what was all this stuff about. And when the album was released in 1977, it was an instant super smash hit. It actually outdid the sales of his predecessor album and created four top ten singles. Dreams went straight to number one. This is the first song of theirs to ever hit that, and I believe it's also the last Fleetwood Mac song to ever have the number one spot on the charts. And Rumors sold over 13 million copies that year, and it was number one for 31 straight weeks. And the thing about Rumors is the sales of this album are still increasing every year since 1977. And it's been, and actually, this is, this is the 40th anniversary of Rumors, by the way, and uh, this year, and um, sales have now reached up to 40 million today. Uh, those are pretty outstanding numbers, and I, I, th- I would have to think that what led to the big success of this album is the fact that it's not only great music, but it gives you an insight into the lives of these musicians, the things you were hearing about the the quote rumors of you know the turmoil between the individual um, musicians and the band members. It, it true. I mean, the rumors were true mm-hmm. um, th- that there was some drama between the band members, but each individual song gave you insight into what the members were feeling. And I can only think that that helped contribute to the record sales that it had, because it gave you an insight to the, the feelings and, and the personal lives of these musicians who chances are you only see up on stage during a concert or here on the radio or you know on vinyl. Mm-hmm. So at that period of time, getting that insight into these guys' lives was pretty incredible. Yeah, it was. You know, just getting insight in, into what was going on with them. This is what what made Rumors appealing. In fact, why it's been it's been highly regarded as one of the best albums ever made in terms of recording quality. It's been actually it, it has been a template for most bands who want to record a great album. This is the, this album is the template for where you for where you want to go, and. It's just it's always been regarded as, and if every year Rolling Stone does their top 500 albums, it's always up there near the top, always. Um, in fact, the album the album won a Grammy for Album of the Year in 1977. At the Grammys, it actually beat out James Taylor and the Star Wars soundtrack. So yeah, the Fleetwood Mac just really sweeped the Grammys that year. They were they were they were on top of the world, and they had money coming in, and they could have they can they could have anything they wanted. Um, 
And the band actually, uh, to support Rumors, went on a year and a half long tour throughout the entire world. It started in 1977 and did not end till early 1978. They were on the road for a long time. And everybody from the record company to fans, everybody could not wait to hear what they had next coming up. Um, and uh, the follow-up to Rumors would, would be an album called Tusk. However, it would be nothing like Rumors at all. That will conclude part one of episode three of The Chain, The Evolution of Fleetwood Mac. Stay tuned to learn more about the Tusk album and how it differed from the Rumors album. Part two coming up next. <laughs> 